Hello, my name is David Bishop and I'll be talking to you today about perioperative phenylephrine use, in particular how to use it during an obstetric spinal anesthetic, but also some of the don'ts and when not to use it. Now phenylephrine is an excellent drug for obstetric spinal hypotension, but it's not the perfect drug for all causes of hypotension during anesthesia. And that brings us to something called the law of unintended consequences. And as we talk more about phenylephrine, we found that people are using it outside of the indication, which is obstetric spinal hypotension or just spinal hypotension. So when you see low blood pressure during an anesthetic, the first thing you have to think is what is the cause of the hypotension? And once you are aware of what the cause is, what would the appropriate drug be to treat that cause. And for the different causes, one would choose different drugs uh, in combination usually with fluid therapy. Now remember that blood pressure or mean arterial pressure is a product of heart rate times stroke volume times total peripheral resistance. And when we aim to treat these things, we will then treat either the heart rate or the inotropy, which will affect stroke volume, or the degree of vasodilation or vasoconstriction which relates to total peripheral resistance. Remember that stroke volume, um, I've written there that we would treat inotropy, but stroke volume often uh, has a lot of other factors that contribute to it. So preload would affect stroke volume and preload would obviously be affected by fluid status. But we are going to be thinking why did the blood pressure drop and which one of those do we think has been affected? And we will then treat the blood pressure based on the receptors that we need to target. And usually we talk about alpha and beta receptors, and there are subcategories which I'm not going to get into, but alpha receptors cause vasoconstriction when you stimulate them. So alpha 1, you stimulate that receptor, you get vasoconstriction, but you don't get any effect on the heart. The beta receptors, um, they are responsible for positive inotropy and for increasing the heart rate. Um, and there is obviously a separate set of, of receptors that we may want to target, depending on whether the hypotension was caused by a failing heart or a bradycardia or vasodilation. We then come to the three most common drugs that we've got available in South Africa, which would be adrenaline, ephedrine, and phenylephrine. And they stimulate those receptors uh, differently. Adrenaline has very strong effects on both alpha and beta uh, receptors. Ephedrine can be thought of as very similar to adrenaline and ephedrine actually works through an indirect action causing a release of adrenaline. So you can expect similar results when you give ephedrine as uh, with adrenaline, except that ephedrine is not as profound a response. So when, you, when your patient's got hypotension but is not an extremist, you would choose ephedrine before you move to ad adrenaline. Phenylephrine though only gives you alpha-1 stimulation. So it's a very powerful vasoconstrictor, but it doesn't help inotropy. It doesn't increase the heart rate. Sometimes you even see the heart rate come down if you overshoot on the blood pressure, a reactive bradycardia. And when you look at those receptors that are involved, you need to consider which drug is appropriate for which cause of hypertension. Now a spinal anesthetic is predominantly a vasodilatory cause of hypertension. So phenylephrine is a very good agent to use. But the other causes, like a general anesthetic, all the components are affected. Preload, afterload, inotropy, heart rate. And so phenylephrine would not be a reflex drug that I pick up when I've got hypotension secondary to general anesthetic. Now I'm going to move uh, into obstetric spinal hypertension and come back to some of that other stuff a bit later. But I gave a talk on this recently on uh, asking the question, does obstetric spinal hypotension matter? Is it something that we need to treat? And very briefly, in, in summary of that whole talk, yes, it does matter. It matters to mother and child, both in the outcomes they experience, negative uh, morbidity and mortality. It matters in the experience of the mother, who it, it's a horrible uh, symptom to have, uh, the symptoms that are related to hypotension, which I'm going to come to. It matters on a medico-legal um, aspect because there is just about no event that occurs in anesthetics that you want a period of hypotension just before that event.
so whether it's the the outcome of the baby with a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or the outcome of the mother hypertension just before that event that wasn't treated doesn't look good and so in our management we need tighter control we need to be more proactive and we need to train people to treat this either very quickly or even prophylactically so we need to treat obstetric spinal hypertension and i've spoken on this before now one of the things i mentioned is that it's it's unpleasant for the mother if you look at intraoperative nausea and vomiting so nausea as well as vomiting it's got a four percent incidence during uh, obstetric spinal anesthetic if you keep the systolic blood pressure at 100 percent of the baseline if you let it drop to 90 percent you get 14 percent of patients have nausea and vomiting intra-op 80 percent that number goes to 40 percent and if you let it drop to 70 percent of baseline 60 percent of patients will have intraoperative nausea and vomiting so this on its own is a reason to treat obstetric spinal hypotension and the graph looks like that this is taken from three different studies i've just put them together to give you an idea so if you target the elimination of intraoperative nausea and vomiting as your goal during obstetric spinal hypotension the other outcomes will take care of themselves the, the well-being of the baby and the mother if you target uh, not allowing that systolic blood pressure to drop below 90 percent of baseline about one in seven of your patients will still have intraoperative nausea and vomiting but that is uh, probably the number that you should aim at keeping it above 90 percent and that's led to us recommending very very soft guidelines uh, indications at least for giving a vasopressor so you should give it if the blood pressure drops below 90 percent of the baseline systolic you should give it if the heart rate goes up by more than 20 percent of the baseline you should give it if the patient is nauseous or vomiting because as you've seen it's predominantly hypotension that causes that you should give it if the patient becomes confused or drowsy or stops talking and if you're not sure whether you should give it then you should give it if you think does the patient need vasopressor then you should give it the default in obstetric spinal hypertension is to treat it and usually that's with fluids and phenylephrine or ephedrine if the, if the heart rate is low the international consensus statement which came out which is a very good re read and it involves one of the local authors in uh, professor dyer uh, they recommend that you treat above 90 percent of the baseline blood pressure so so look at that systolic blood pressure when you take your first blood pressure and aim to keep it at 90 percent of that baseline and it's led to all these complicated algorithms that have been released i just want to show you that right at the heart of them they've got that you should run a prophylactic phenylephrine infusion in all patients so that's the recommendation so ask yourself are you doing that and if you aren't why aren't you it's in the guidelines it's considered the gold standard now some institutions don't and it is defendable to use a reactive strategy so you wait until you see something like the heart rate go up or the blood pressure go down or the patient develops symptoms and then you treat but you must be very very quick to treat so if you're an experienced anesthetist it's absolutely fine my preference is to use the infusions but the, uh, there's some very good units that don't so you're not mandated to use it but it is advised now I want you just to stop there because I'm going to come to how to give that phenylephrine infusion but we need to be very very careful that we don't think we give the phenylephrine infusion and that means we don't have to do the basics right you must earn the right to use the phenylephrine infusion we want to use it for spinal hypotension we don't want to use it in bleeding patients or in general anesthesia or after the baby's delivered and the oxytocin's in if the patients are hypotensive in those scenarios i don't reach for phenylephrine infusions as my first line vasopressor i will choose something with some inotropy um, and some chronotropy such as ephedrine or adrenaline so we use phenylephrine for pure vasodilatory states and that occurs usually in obstetric spinal anesthesia you find the cardiac output is excellent but the patient is vasodilated if you're not sure of the cause you just have no idea why the patient's hypotensive then i would advise that you choose ephedrine or adrenaline and remember to give fluids until you can establish the cause if the only drug you've got drawn up is phenylephrine you can use it as a bridge 
but remember to examine that cause and to find out why the patient's hypotensive. And if the patient's bleeding or is hypovolemic, the number one treatment is obviously the fluids, either crystalloid or blood products. But while you're bridging, so if the patient's blood pressure is really low and you need to use a drug, choose ephedrine or adrenaline, not phenylephrine. And the reason that I'm stressing this is that we're increasingly hearing quite uh, senior anesthetists or registrars at exams mentioning phenylephrine as their go-to drug. And there's only very limited animal evidence that suggests that it may be of use. Uh, on a physiological and pharmacological basis, it would not be my first choice agent. So get used to using um, ephedrine and even adrenaline, low-dose adrenaline infusions. Um, Phenylephrine is not the number one choice in these situations. Uh, when you use a prophylactic phenylephrine infusion, you need to have a fluid strategy. And the first thing to note is that the patients coming in must be fluid replete. They must be well hydrated. And if you need to replace fluid, then do it before you put the spinal in. Don't think I'll put the spinal in and then I'll give them fluid. Give them the fluid before you start. We call that reloading. And you'll see in the ESMOE guidelines that you're asked to give 500 mils as a preload. Actually, why that guideline says that is because they're assuming that you've not been able to assess the fluid status correctly and that the patient's a bit behind in fluids. And that's what that 500 mils is for. And then co-load fluid. So once the spinal goes in, run your liter of fluid fast. Try and get a liter in by the time the baby's out. Um, and that's a, that's a good co-load. And then once the baby's out, you run the, the fluid, the second liter over the duration of the seizure, assuming blood loss is normal. Remember, when you mix phenylephrine, all infusions I talk about, it's the same mix as you would for bolus um, injections. You take 200 mils normal saline, you put in one amp, which is 10 milligrams of phenylephrine, that gives you 50 mics per mil. And so when I talk about the rates of the infusion, this is the solution that I'm assuming you're using. There are places where they mix it up differently. I wouldn't advise that because you're going to run into drug errors. And phenylephrine is one of those drugs where you really don't want to have a drug error. If you give them an amp of phenylephrine as a single bolus, that is going to be a lethal dose. So diluting the phenylephrine is very, very important. And then these are the ESMOE guidelines. I'm not going to go through them again. Just to remind you, um, and you need to get good IV access, and that preload is really more of a reload. If your patient's behind in fluid, then give them some fluid. The co-load should be the rest of the bag. So when I've got a well hydrated patient, I just use the full liter as the co-load. Get the spinal dose right. Make sure there's a wedge in um, to take the pressure off the, the vena cava. Uh, and if you do those things properly, then you'll be able to use a phenylephrine infusion. And finally, when you thinking about giving a prophylactic phenylephrine infusion, think about your context. Are you here with m lots of staff members and you're able to really focus on running that infusion? Or are you potentially in a, in a more rural environment and you're multitasking? You're being expected to look after the baby and fetch things for the surgeon and you're going to be distracted. And you need to pick the right prophylactic phenylephrine infusion for your patient. So in all infusions, use phenylephrine 50 mics per mil. The recommended rate is 25 to 50 mics per minute. So if we're using that solution, that is 30 to 60 mils an hour. So whatever infusion rate you start, it's going to be between 30 and 60 mils an hour. You separate it if you can. So ideally you have it on a, a three-way tap and you run a syringe driver. You don't put up two drips. You only have one drip, one good size cannula. You run the liter, but you try and run it on a syringe driver or using an IVAC if you can. And you only start that infusion after the spinal anesthetic is in. So you put the spinal anesthetic in, you lie the patient down, uh, you make sure the wedge is in place, you start the phenylephrine infusion. And so the way that you, you would do this is that you, if you're in a setting where you're an experienced anesthetist and you're comfortable doing this, you start at, a, at between 30 and 60 mils an hour. So I usually start at 50 mils an hour. And then after two minutes, you start titrating up and down, depending on your response, aiming to keep the systolic blood pressure above 90% of baseline. If you're a beginner and you're going to try this for the very first time, 
then I recommend that you just use a fixed rate on the lower end. So 30 mils an hour, that's 25 mics per minute. So you lie the patient down, you start at 30 mils an hour, and you don't touch it. If the patient needs a bolus, you just give that on top of the infusion. So you can add phenylephrine or ephedrine, whatever you like, to that rate. You just leave it at 30 mils an hour. And this works very nicely, but it won't eliminate hypotension. You, you will often have to give boluses as well. And finally, if you don't have a syringe driver or an IVAC, you can put 500 mics of phenylephrine, and I'll come to it on the next slide, into that first liter that you're going to run as a co-load. And you run that co-load over 10 to 20 minutes. And if you run it over 10 to 20 minutes, that's like running a phenylephrine infusion at 30 to 60 mils an hour. So you just change the rate of the fluid and you're giving fluids and phenylephrine is perfect and it's been it's in the international consensus statement as a as a guide and we tested this at edendale hospital and it works very nicely and it's fairly low risk so that's the recipe add 500 micrograms of phenylephrine to the first liter of ringer's lactate and once the spinal anesthetic's been uh, administered you run at 10 to 20 minutes you run that uh, that infusion in and if you've used a little bit of the fluid up so you've only got 800 mils in the bag you can still add 500 mics a lot of people actually use a thousand mics anyway so it doesn't matter if it's slightly more concentrated and if the patient's blood pressure is above the baseline systolic you just stop the infusion it's absolutely fine so those are your choices and I, I recommend that you go out and try it but when you see this working and it will work don't assume that now that's what you're going to do for, for hypotension whenever you see it. <clears throat> and that's what we found. Patients who've bled out are on phenylephrine infusions or patients that have heart failure and they're on phenylephrine infusions. And that is, that is a very bad response to a hypotension in those other settings. So fixed rate, 30 mils an hour for a beginner. If you feel more confident, you can titrate it up and down between 30 and 60 mils an hour. And if you don't have a syringe driver, and this is what I do when I'm in a district hospital. I just put 500 mics in the first liter, which is 10 mils of phenylephrine. And then I just run that. Once the baby is out and the baby's delivered and I've given oxytocin, I then aim to wean that infusion quite quickly. And if you've got persistent hypotension, it could still be obstetric spinal hypotension, but you must start looking for other causes, in particular bleeding. And that's really all I want to say on that. I think that uh, we need to start using phenylephrine and obstetric spinal anesthetics more. And I'd like you to go home and think, I need to try that. Uh, and then on the don't side, please don't start using it outside of that setting where I think phenylephrine is, is probably an inappropriate first choice of vasopressor. Thanks very much.